It's so wonderful to see so many of you here and all of your smiling faces. Here comes our announcement, thanks to Joy Jones. Yeah. Uh, cab this week, Friday, October 6th at 9 o'clock. Come dance the night away in the basement of Herb at Club Heston. Earn one CE point. Next. Ooh, Club Heston. Yeah. Whoa, whoa. I might have to show up. Okay, all right. <laughs> Tomorrow night, this is super, 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 super important. We have Narcan training. It's from 7 to 8 p.m. and it's right across the hallway here in the community center. We're going to learn, and, and faculty and staff, this is for you too. We're going to learn the difference between different types of overdose. We're actually going to perform rescue breathing. On, on a mannequin, I, I think, yeah. And we're gonna, we're gonna practice calling emergency medical services. We're gonna practice actually using Narcan because, you know, we love each other enough as a community that we wanna take care of each other, okay? And then if you come, you're gonna get 10 points, just like a formation, and you're gonna get two doses of this Narcan um, so that you can be helpful to somebody should that ever happen. Next. Lunch and learn with Counselor Jose on Wednesday, October 4th in Sauter B room from noon to one. Uh, earn five CE points and door prizes. Door prizes? Mm -hmm. Door prizes. The topic, of, the topic of this meeting is healthy stress management for the college students. Uh, participants will walk away with tools for handling stress that cover the whole person, mind, body, and spirit. Next. Next. Health Ministries Clinic Mobile, known as HMC Mobile, will be on campus Wednesday in two days, October 4, in the Yoast parking lot from 1.30 to 4.15. This is a walk-in cl clinic. Services provided include prevention care, lab testing, treatment of routine illnesses, immunizations, counseling, and much more. That's counseling, I can't even talk. How it works is simple. You go through a normal registration and intake process, and then you receive the care. That care is provided on a first come, first served basis. You scan the QR code, which is right up there, and we can get it for you today afterwards as well, to see the schedule. Next. Intramurals are the way to get to know other students on campus and play sports for fun. Thursday, October 5th at 8 p.m. in the CAC will be kickball. Sign up on the board in the Lark's Nest. Participants will earn one CE point. Next. Greater Things, which is a wonderful, wonderful, it's, it's a combination of our faith lives, our spiritual lives, and athletics. It meets Sunday, October 8th at 7 p.m. in the Yoast Team Room. I think you can come even if you're not an athlete, and that is right. Yeah, that is absolutely right. Our own Nick Wynn, who has a great story, will be sharing. Those who attend get five CE points. Next. Now announcements from athletics. Woo, give me a hand. Yeah, let's start with our shout outs from last week. Women's soccer beat South East CC with 6-0 on Saturday. Goals were scored by Kira Kumara. She had five goals. And JC Walker with one goal. And, and volleyball had a great weekend with two wins in Illinois. First win was 3-0 against Dayspring Bible College and 3-1 versus Trinton College. For this week, we'll have Wednesday soccer at Prep CC. We play at 5 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. Also Wednesday, volleyball will be at Coffeeville at 6.30. Friday, volleyball will play at home against Bethel College GV at 6.30. For the weekend, um, on Saturday, soccer is home against Johnson County CC. Uh, we'll play at 1 and 3.30 p.m. Also Saturday, Baseball, we will be at Friends University. And Sunday, softball has a home game against Seward County, and that will be taking place at 1 and 3 p.m. Go Larks! I accidentally, yeah, okay. Well, it is, it is a, a true honor of mine to introduce Whitney Douglas to you. 
Um, not only is she our director of Title IX services and, and, and doing such, such important ministry there, but Whitney is a personal friend. So I want you, as, as we get prepared to interact with her on very important topics, to see her not only as our person who helps us really do absolutely the right thing when it comes to Title IX issues, but I also want you to see her as a follower of Jesus, as a wife, as a mother of the cutest little guy you've ever known, as one who likes to do fun things, one who is a friend, one who can hold confidences, uh, a person who can be trusted, a, a person who actually cares for every single one of you. I want you to see Whitney through that lens. Before she comes up, I would like for us to pray. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to be with us. Holy Spirit, you are walking with us. And for some of us, it's been kind of a tough week and we've been deeply hurt. For those who have been deeply hurt, Lord, especially hold and carry and love them. For those struggling with depression, anxiety, bring healing. For those who are rejoicing today because it was a fantastic week and weekend, oh Lord, help them rejoice. For those who are tired from the play or from athletics, oh Lord, bring refreshment. For those who are just overwhelmed by too many papers and exams, dear Lord, bring extra hours of the day. And help us love you and help us love each other and help us love ourselves. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yeah, give her a big hand. All right. Good morning. Thank you, Michelle, for that introduction. Um, my name is Whitney Douglas, and I am the Title IX coordinator here at Heston College. Um, and this is my lovely family, my husband John and my son Otto. Tomorrow is Otto's birthday, and he'll be three years old, and he is just the greatest, and we, uh, we think a lot of him. And uh, I also, um, you know, I'm a Title IX coordinator here. I've been here for a little over a year, but um, that is not all I have been or studied in my life. Um, and in, a, in what feels like a past lifetime at this point, um, I was a pastor and um, that is what a lot of my formal education has been, is in theological training. And so you are getting Pastor Whitney Douglas this morning more than you are getting Title IX Coordinator Whitney Douglas, but it's some blended merge of the two. And the truth is um, you kind of always get Pastor Whitney Douglas when you get me, uh, because that's just a little bit of who I am. Um, I do want to give you a little bit of a relevant announcement before we get started. October 4th at 1.20 p.m., there's going to be a national emergency alert test that will be broadcast to all cell phones. This, um, all cell phones are going to make a noise. They're going to vibrate or read the, the alert out loud. The national alerts like this can be disabled or turned off. The test for the broadcast is 30 minutes, so you may get the alert anytime in that kind of 30 minute window. And uh, so if you're gonna be in class or whatever, you might consider turning off your phones during that time if you want. But in particular, if you are in a situation where um, be maybe because of your safety or something like that, you have a phone that others don't know about that is hidden, um, then you will want to shut it off and leave it off for at least 30 minutes. And you'll want to do that uh, before 1.20 p.m. on October 4th, which is Wednesday. So um, in this October is uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and we're going to look at that a little bit in what we're talking about today. Um, and so in honor of that, I just wanted to give that warning. If you have a phone that is for your safety and your safety would be compromised if someone else knew about that phone, I want you to know that that national em emergency alert is going to be happening and um, you should plan accordingly. 
Okay, so um, I want to start by offering a little bit of a trigger warning. We are going to talk about sexual assault today, and we're going to talk about abusive power structures and stuff like that. So if that is going to be uh, something that is triggering for you, one, I just want you to be aware before we start, but also if something rises in you that you didn't anticipate um, and you need to take some space, that is totally appropriate. And if you also just like kind of need to pee, that is totally appropriate. Feel free to take a step out, go to the restroom, take a breather, step back in if you can. Um, there will be some people available in the back um, and uh, will be out there after as well. And these people are our confidential resources. And these people on campus, if you tell them something uh, about anything, they can hold that in complete confidence. You don't have to share that information with anyone. Um, if you share something with any other employee of Heston College, they are responsible employees, which means that they are responsible to connect you to the Title IX office. If the sexual misconduct that you experienced or discrimination you experienced happened at Heston College or in our programs or activities, they're gonna have to connect you with me so you can get the resources you need. Um, and, but you're more than welcome to talk to any trusted employee um, um, at Heston, they have all been trained to handle um, and, and process that with you. But these ones in particular do not have to share with anyone unless you report to them that you intend to harm yourself or someone else. They don't have to report what you say to anyone and, and in fact they're bound by law to not do that without your explicit written signed consent. Um, so. With that, I wanna give you a little bit of context for our community and why we're talking about this now. Some of you are uh, freshmen, right? Raise your hand if you're a freshman. So freshmen, you were not here last year, right? That's how freshmen works. And so um, you may or may not have picked up on things that you've observed or heard about related to Title IX and the history of that here at Heston College. But if you haven't, I wanna give you just a little bit of, of context. Last year, um, in September, student activists um, used their voice and other resources that they had uh, gathered to raise concerns about things that had been happening at Title IX or in Title IX matters at Heston College. Um, that students felt like there were um, there was not the appropriate and maybe even at times inappropriate or illegal uh, responses from the institution or members of the institution when reports of sexualized violence were brought to them. And so out of that activism came a um, review. We hired a firm, Cozen O'Connor, to give us a trauma-informed and uh, legally compliant review of our Title IX practices and procedures over uh, the last five years. And that review, um, though not surprising to those of us who, who knew a little bit about what to expect, was very sobering. Um, and it, under, it uncovered a lot of deep, um, kind of toxic and unhealthy patterns in the way we handle issues like this in community. And I don't think Heston is unique to that pull to handle things, uh, handle things that are uncomfortable in ways that um, save face or not embarrass the institution or something like that. And when that happens at Heston or anywhere, the expense is catastrophic. The expense is the well-being, sometimes even the lives of individuals who have already experienced horrific harm. Um, and so I'm gonna start by giving you, I'm gonna read a few things that were in this report. The whole report is available on our website. It's like 60 pages long, but if you're interested, you can read it or you can look at different parts of it. I'm gonna tell you some of the highlights and then we're gonna go into how to understand um, a biblical path forward here and what God has to say in situations like this. So there's a summary of the report uh, they summarized into these kind of five bullet points, their biggest concern. 
They identified instances in which the former Title IX coordinator and the Vice President of Student Life did not recognize or identify some Title IX related issues and reports of potential sexual and gender-based harassment or violence. Instances where the responses by the former Title IX coordinator lacked the required outreach and or the provision of supportive measures and explanation of process to enable informed decisions making a, uh, by making a, compliant, a complaint on whether to file a formal complaint. Um, instances where complainants were encouraged or required to participate in informal resolution process without meeting the notice and mutual agreement requirements of Title IX. Instances where the former Title IX coordinator and the Vice President of Student Life failed to respond to reports of, uh, based on a misunderstanding or a misapplication of the law and instances in which college employees, both faculty and staff, failed to comply with their responsibilities to report sexual and gender-based harassment and violence to the former Title IX coordinator. I am gonna read some quotes that are in the report that are directly from impacted students, alumni, and employees of Heston College. One said, a lot of what I experienced with admin and professors was the faith position. They really pushed to forgive. That's really sore for me. I was never allowed to be mad. They pushed so much forgiveness. I was told about counseling options. I was never followed up with again, though. I was under suicide watch, but no one came to check on me. Another said, I feel like I had a certain naivete about both the abuse and then this idea of the college, the branch of the church, and its commitment to justice. I thought institu institutions were leaps and bounds ahead of where they were. I'm embarrassed by how naive I was. I feel a deep sense of betrayal. There was a fear among survivors that they had not be taken seriously enough. If you're a victim, the burden is placed on you to forgive and forget. It's made to sound like it's your responsibility to reconcile the behavior. A close friend of mine reported sexual assault. Watching her come forward and get shut down was hard to watch. It hurt her a lot. For her to keep telling me that these adults were shying away from her, uh, telling her not to report and trying to dismiss what happened to her. I walked with another friend as well as she worked with student life throughout her journey, watching her get beat down. There was not a ton of support for her either from the college. Another said, I've also heard from other friends that reaching out to people in administration, even the president, regarding sexual assault on campus and Title IX policies and the environment and being brushed off and not taken seriously enough to where any meaningful action is taken. They were trying to reconcile and please everyone, and opposed to dealing with the situation. The college protects predators in the conflict resolution method. This needs a deep sense of urgency. We cannot continue having the approach of, oh, there is an issue, let's try to mitigate, but really, we don't get to the root of the issue and take and flush things out. These are just some of the really hard things to read in that report. Times where people were pushed to meet with their abuser and forgive. Uh, times where people who had been abused were being told maybe that they were complicit in the behavior and it was somehow also maybe their fault. I believe personally that God designed us to be in community and that he sets out for us invitation and direction on how to manage this really messy and ugly part of our shared humanity because it doesn't seem possible that we live in community and that pain and hurt doesn't happen. So what now? I'm gonna to read to you from Matthew 18, verses one through 14, and then we're gonna unpack it. 
This is really intense, so I want you to listen. Um, this is Jesus talking, and Jesus is intentionally trying to shock you with what he's saying here. At the time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come. But woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands and two feet and be thrown into an eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think if a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away? Will he not leave? the 99 on the hill, and go to look for the one that wandered off. And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that didn't ever wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. So that uh, is intense. It would be better that a millstone be hung around your neck and that you would be thrown in to the sea and drown. A millstone, this is a picture of a mill and that round stone in there is what is called a millstone. You'd uh, attached cattle or something, a uh, horse to that and put grain in that kind of canal and the horse or whatever animal would walk in circles, milling up that grain, right? So this is just ancient technology. But that millstone is massive and has a big hole in the middle. And what they're suggesting is that that massive thing be tied around your neck and you thrown in to the sea to drown. Um, if you, that that would be better than what you would do if you caused a little one to stumble. And when he says little one here, he is using an analogy. He, he maybe literally brought out a child, but he says these little ones, the ones who believe in me. When he talks about little ones here, he's talking about disciples. He is talking about people, um, all of us, really. But I do think there is this special emphasis on the vulnerable, on those much like children who are more easily manipulated or harmed, right? And so this millstone is one really violent image in here. And the others um, are these self-mutilation things, right? Like, why don't you cut off your hand, gouge out your eye, cut off your foot. Um, and I, it's actually not the first time in Matthew that Jesus does this talks about self-mutilation. In Matthew 5, um, he, in 27 for, through 30, he says, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. 
And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole party, body to go to hell. So Jesus here is talking about um, issues of adultery and issues of lust, right? And he says that it's really a matter of the heart, right? That you've already, like, the problem is the, the attitude of your heart that sets you down the path that ends in adultery, not just the act of adultery. The, the problem is the attitude of the heart. And I don't really see how physical mutilation helps the attitude of the heart, right? And so just a face value, there's not, not really enough there necessarily. But in, and then, you know, he repeats this and he talks about it here and he adds the idea of the foot. Um, and then if we look at Jewish imagery, we get a little bit better picture of what to do with these kind of grotesque analogies here. I do think Jesus very intentionally wanted to shock us with these grotesque analogies to really take serious these matters. But also, if you read through Proverbs and you look at the times where the words, uh, where there's analogies about eyes, hands, and feet, you'll start to see what these things represented for them and that the readers would have seen that as well. Eyes are metaphorically about how we see the world and specifically how we see other people in the world compared to us. Hands uh, represent what we do, our actual actions we take, and feet represent the path we take, the person we become. So as we take that Jewish understanding of these metaphors and we apply that to this text, Jesus might be suggesting that the way we view people um, undoubtedly impacts the way we treat them. When I think I'm better than you, I might not treat you well, right? And then the way I treat people becomes habits, and those habits in my life form my character, and they create the path that my feet walk on, and that path creates the reality that is the person you are, the, the character you display in the world. And so Jesus says it's worth even the most incredibly painful sacrifice to deal with whatever it is that causes you to put onto others the brokenness that exists within you, right? So Jesus first says, woe to the world, because like everybody's screwing up, and that, that really resonates in 2023. Um, but also like this is kind of how it's going to be forever. So like, but especially woe to you if you participate in it. So it's, it's going to happen, but also don't be involved. So when we are hurt, we can repeat that hurt, right? Like we hurt people, hurt people, hurt people, hurt people, and hurt people. And that continues forever or there's an interruption, right? And so the invitation here is to interrupt that pattern. And so if you recognize in yourself these broken places and you see how they're spewing out harm, maybe to yourself and towards others, Jesus is saying, you need to deal with that, right? Or else, hell, right? So hell, the word hell is um, here from the Greek word Gehenna, which is actually just Greek letters to make a Hebrew word, um, Gai Hinnom, which literally just means the valley of Hinnom, which was a literal place outside of Israel. Israel was a city with walls around it on a hill. It still is uh, a city on a hill. And then this, naturally, there's these valleys, right? So Hinnom is this valley. It's just like a literal physical place. And um, Way, way, way back in the day, pre-Jesus, Israel had a king named Manasseh who decided, like, I'm going to just, like, kind of adapt some of these other cultures around us and engage with them and their practices. And so he decided he was going to take on this practice of um, another religion of baby sacrifices. So in this valley of Gehinnom, um, of Hinnom, he built altars and invited Israelites to join him in the burning of babies. They started a fire and burnt babies and sacrificed them to some other religion's god to kind of, I don't know, 
be a part of the world, engage, make friends with the other folks. And um, you can read about that in um, 2 Kings 21 through 23 and Jeremiah 19. Um, and then Jesus, or God decides that he's going he's gonna to handle that. He's going to deal with that. And he's going to deal with it really intensely. And so you can read all about that in Jeremiah Maya 19, what God has to say about that. But in the end, what happens is God decides these people who did this harm, they got to get the hell out of his city. And they deserve to die, and they, their dead bodies are thrown into this valley that is still on fire. And that, that is God's judgment for them. The fire that they started the hell they created. God said, I will give you over to what you have decided to become and give your life to. And as a result, um, you pave your own way into a hell you made for yourself, right? And that is God's judgment. So that is what God, what Jesus is talking about here. And these, these readers would have known about Gehenna, and what that was. That the reality is, for your own sake and the sake of everyone else, you have to deal with the brokenness in you that is coming out in these bad, awful, harmful, abusive ways. Otherwise, you continue down this path into the hell you've made for yourself. And a just God's judgment is that we would get what we gave, right? But the invitation of Jesus is to interrupt that and not perpetuate that cycle. So the invitation is to deal with it, right? And that is what we are needing to do here at Heston College and is what we're needing to do in our own hearts. Here at Heston, I am leading efforts to try and deal with our systemic issues. The implementation group is meeting regularly, and we are um, a group of people that are from across this campus. A couple of students are on our team as well as employees, and we're trying to uh, implement the recommendations of the Cozen O'Connor report. We're committed to doing all of those, and we're in acknowledging and apologizing, and we are creating new programs, and we are offering more mental health holistic programming with uh, Jose leading that, and we're continuing to develop more and more ways to create a healthier community and to get rid of whatever junk lives within us. And I am inviting all of you to do that in your own life if you need to, but also to recognize the ways that things that have done, been done to you, the patterns of abuse that have existed, whether in s systems and powers that you have been engaged in or in your personal relationships, are toxic and they need to be let go. And we are at time, because I can talk forever, but I want to invite you to join me in this um, celebration of this week um, by grabbing one of these red flags on your way out um, before you go. And there's on the sides here, there's red flags. So everybody can go where they need to go. And there's Sharpies over there. And I want you to write on a red flag. Um, think about for a moment, a sign that, you're, that a relationship's not okay. That um, whether it's a system of power or interpersonal relationship, that people are protecting themselves first, that they protect reputations over people harm, they avoid taking responsibility. And write, write something on these red flags and then come put them in these vases. We will display these red flags on campus this week to invite people to recognize the red flags of relationships they're in and to make the choice to leave when it's time. You do not have to stay. God does not ask you to stay in relationships that are harmful and toxic and abusive. You have the right to leave. Um, help invite hope to all of us um, through participating in that. And, um, and then as you leave, please leave in silence. 
and um, honor this space. I'm available um, in my office in Smith Center if you want to chat, um, and there's confidential resources on campus available now and in the future if you need to talk to somebody. Thank you.